Uh, it's now nine o'clock. Uh, I'm going to keep it tight today. I'm going to start, and I'm going to start by doing a little bit of revision. We'll have a look at what people said in the uh, forum over the last few days. Uh, you remember we met on uh, Friday, and we asked you to get stuck into the different forums, and uh, let's have a look at what some of you said. So uh, just to revise on what we did uh, on Friday is we had our guest lecturer, Ephraim, came and joined us. But basically, we were talking about how do people learn and how do we know that they have learned? So I introduced the section on learning design. How do you design good courseware? What's the best practice? And I'm the one who kept championing um, a non-didactic approach specifically for online learning, where uh, students were active, where they worked collaboratively, where they had a sense of agency in terms of their um, learning, and where the educator had become a facilitator rather than a lecturer as such. And then Ephraim took over, and he uh, was talking about quality assurance initially, but the discussion became very much about assessment. How do we know that learning is taking place? And he was going on about authentic assessment. He was encouraging us to think about, is the way we are testing people authentic? We are trying to achieve specific outcomes, but does the assessment actually measure those outcomes is what he was saying. And what's more, those outcomes should normally be associated with whatever their professional um, activities will be. They need to be, the outcomes and the assessment need to be aligned with whatever their professional skills will be in the future. All right, so that was basically our message on Friday. And as management, we felt that you guys need to monitor this carefully. Are you just make, are you just an uh, exam mill? Is ISCED really just trying to get enrollments and then make people write an exam and then give them a piece of paper? Is that what you are? Or are you preparing the next generation of professionals to actually make an impact within Mozambique? Obviously, we feel <laughs> you should be the second. And um, the uh, we don't want you just to be an exam, uh, a certificate mill. That's a bit useless. And... Um, doesn't really contribute to the growth of, of the country. Um, so therefore, we asked you, um, to what extent do you feel that the ISCED was ready for this type of assessment? And to what extent you felt that students are ready for this type of assessment? So I'm going to just have a look at a few of the responses that are on the screen. Let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see the screen. All right. To alleviate the challenges students are likely to face in using e-assessment, I think first we need to redesign our assessment portfolio, looking for e-learning and influencing the government policymakers to address regulations that meet e-learning needs related to assessment, because to continue to regulate e-learning as a classic education. We need to prepare our tutors understanding that giving feedback is a way to motivate students' participation on assessment as a part of the learning process. Tutors need to be more interactive with students. All right, so uh, Cesaro uh, there is making a good point, is that um, assessment also doesn't necessarily have to be summative. A, a good formative assessments can be a very important tool in the learning process. But for that to work, the tutors need to have their, their mandate very clearly defined that they are supporting the learning process uh, and that they have a key role to play as a facilitator. Tutors need to be more interactive with students. They've got to get their hands dirty. They've got to get involved, says Cesaro. And I, I, I fully endorse that approach. I think that's very, very insightful. Uh, and Edgar also replies to that. He says, this was a very good insight. I had not considered the government policies yet. It is perhaps the most relevant barrier so far. As Dr. Andrew, that would be nice if I was a doctor, we need to move to the next level of evaluations. We need authentic evaluations. But I have a feeling there is a long way to go until the legal environment properly accommodates 
ISCED's educational philosophy. Still, this year certainly made the authorities seriously consider incentives for distance education. So, uh, Edgar, nice. All right. Uh, I would say that, yes, if, if anyone needs to influence government policies, it's you guys. You need to um, set the agenda. You are moving in a territory where classical education um, is still grappling with some of the basics. When you're already moving into higher level operationalized um, education in this environment. So I, I'm thinking in many ways, the government would listen to you guys if you were to say, but your policies are very old fashioned. They're very much in the exam mill, certificate mill uh, mode. And uh, we've moved beyond that now. We are trying to prepare the next generation. Hence, we need these changes. So yes, an analysis of government policy and then uh, an attempt to influence what that policy revisions might be in the future. Nice. Uh, I'm gonna look for someone else. Uh, oh, who have we got here? Antonio. As far as the policymakers are concerned, we need to understand their poor knowledge of distance education. The regulators are people like us. Unfortunately, only few of them will have the training or the necessary understanding of distance education in order to make appropriate judgments. So Antonio is endorsing what I've said. If anyone is going to influence them, it's you. All right, you've got to start talking the talk. You've got to... Uh, for want of a better word, you've got to be evangelists, but for distance education and online education, uh, the idea is you've got to be passionate and quite outspoken in terms of what you feel should be there. So I agree with Antonio. Nice. I'm having a look at Emil Carr. Um, ISCED should use e-assessment in course design because all programs are full online and students don't know, don't need to be on campus for any of the assessment, for all of it to work on the platform. And in this case, the online assessment methods are fairly predictable and it is likely that there will be more innovative approaches introduced to meet the needs of the different types of qualifications. I'm currently working with AERC um, African Economic Consortium for Research, but they're basically agricultural economists and they've got a master's program, which I'm helping them on. And they're grappling with that very question at the moment about how do you do assessment online? And my biggest headache is to get them to get away from the good old fashioned um, invigilated venue driven examination. They're getting there, but oh, it's hard work. And I think you guys are already there. You understand that the old fashioned exam way of a uh, model of summative assessment needs to change. So I think Amilcar is pointing that out. So nice. ISCED should train the tutors and students how to write authentic assessment tasks and how to solve it in the learning platform and give their feedback. All right, now tutors again, are, uh, as we mentioned, it's a team approach now to the design of courses and therefore the facilitators and the tutors are very, very important, okay? They have a big role to play, so I agree. And finally, ISED to alleviate the challenges should train the students how to solve the assessment using e-assessment. And each time when we are introducing new courses, we should train the tutors, the students and all the staff. And yeah, nice. I agree. So does Edgar. All right. Uh, and I could go on and on. You can see that uh, what's very nice for me is that you guys were very receptive to the, the, the values that... Uh, um, both Ephraim and I were trying to get across. We are going to look at the technical side of assessment in some more detail later on. There's another week um, um, specifically on assessment, and we will look at formative and summative and diagnostic assessments and what digital tools are available. But we won't deviate from our championing of authentic assessment. So keep that uh, that in mind. All right. I, 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 I'm not going to go, we could spend the whole hour because this is good stuff in here. I'm very happy. Um, we're getting some good responses. So 12 of you engaged with 
this particular discussion, Forum 4, and um, but there were 30 odd of you in the session. So in the future, I want to see more people involved in the forum discussions. We are watching them. I can't always engage um, uh, time, timely. I tend to be always catching up. Um, I, <laughs> it's, don't, don't do as I do, do as I say. <laughs> Uh, I am flawed at the moment. I'm running from one thing to the other, but I'm very excited that the discussions are worthwhile and that you should be involved in them. And so, yes, please, please do get involved with Forum 5. All right. Um, any questions before we start our formal, our formal presentation for today? Does anyone I would like, to... I would like to understand better the, uh, ARCs system? Uh, yes. All yes. right. Uh, because it, it was easy to understand the, 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 the other models, uh, uh, how to apply. The ARC seems to be more of a um, motivational, uh, just to engage the students. But uh, how do we apply it, for example, uh, evaluation? Uh, after we, for example, involve the students, how can we apply for the following steps for the entire uh, learning process? Okay, right. So um, remember that what we were looking specifically at there was the learn, how do people learn? All right, so that was the angle I came in. And um, we, we weren't really looking at like, um, how do you develop a course? So the three models I showed you were specifically based on research to do with how we understand people learn. So the ADI model, for example, um, uh, was considered um, not a model of how people learn, it's how you create a course. So I think those course creation models are more likely going to answer your question. So your question was, how do we know how assessment fits, fits in? How would you fashion your assessment around the ARCS model, etc.? Is more to do with the whole idea of course creation. Uh, the ARCS model is, as you've pointed out quite correctly, it is a way of organizing the learning so that students are highly motivated, so that they are engaged and that they feel comfortable and um, satisfied and confident and uh, excited by what the learning is uh, is, is happening. So uh, really it's a lens for you. You could even have a design, a, an existing course and then you can say to what extent have I used the ARCS model? Have I gained their attention? Have I made an environment where they feel um, uh, relaxed and confident? Um, uh, is there the do they come out of the whole thing feeling satisfied? So if you use the ARCS as a lens to analyze your course, then even an existing course, you could go in and say, all right, well, let's let's beef up the attention section or let's beef up the ability for them to become satisfied learners. So it is a it is a model which uses motivation as the key lens, the, 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 the way to do the analysis of your program or your course. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by it, but I've never really used that model myself. I tend to use Merrill um, when I'm designing a course. I try and make sure that there's a good chunk of demonstration up front, that there's a, a real world task to try and solve and that there's an opportunity towards the end for the students to disengage and become their own their own agents in the learning process. I, I try and let the lecturer let go at, at some point uh, towards the middle and give them plenty to do where they work collaboratively or uh, on their own. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, yeah. Okay, any other yeah, questions? Thank you very much. Any other questions? Based on last week's work? All right, but even if something you think of something, stick it in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, but I'm going to push on with today's program. 
I really want to try and keep it to an hour because I know how busy you are. Um, so let's push on and let's uh, look at today's program. So today what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at OERs. Wisdom has mentioned in the past that this is an area where ISED and even previously when he worked at the Catholic University of Mozambique, that um, he felt the institutions were missing a potential advantage. All right, so we're going to spend today's program looking at what we call open content or open educational resources. We're going to explain what they are. We're going to show you the value proposition. And then we're going to talk about what is the role of OERs and open content for Portuguese content, Portuguese language, Lucifone content. All right. So that's my little program today. We're going to have a look. What is this thing? How do we know that it's open? Creative Commons licensing. What are some of the adaptation techniques? And then we're going to look at the role of Portuguese OER. All right, by now you should know me, all right? I've, I'm always around, but if you really want to know more about me, why would you? Uh, you can go look at the YouTube account and the Flickr account, and if you really want to, you can look at the Facebook, although I'm a boring old whatnot. So, but anyway, there's all my stuff. All right, so what are we? Sorry, oh, sorry to disturb you, and yes, yes. just a quick uh, information. Uh, some of our colleagues are having challenges to access the system. Oh, right. Maybe the they're problem. in the waiting room. I'm Maybe trying to ask, uh, assist some of them. Oh, yes. Sorry, there's people in the waiting room. Give me a second while I just sort that out. I'm on my own today, so I'm trying to be the back channel manager and also the... Oh, yeah, there's lots. All right, here they come. All right, welcome to those people who have just entered the room. Uh, while you were waiting, the waiting room we were talking about last week and the pros and cons and some of the things that people were written in the forum and so on. And I was just saying, I'm very excited that um, the discussions are really good in the forum. So um, I'd encourage you guys, if you did not get involved, I noticed in forum four, 12 people were at it and it was really good. I would like to see a lot more in the forum in the future. Today's program is we're looking at open content, all right? And I mentioned as an introduction that Wisdom has mentioned previously to me that he feels that this is an area where the ISED and even his previous institution when he was working at the Catholic University of Mozambique, that the they weren't really exploiting this potential benefits of this system. So what I'm going to try and do today is just lay the foundations of what these open content is, and uh, we will uh, then see to what extent it is useful for a Portuguese language institution. All right. So what is this open content? And the basically it is teaching and learning materials which have been released with an open license, which means that you can take them for free. They don't cost any, anything in terms of their intellectual property. There's no subscriptions. There are no um, uh, costs. You don't have to buy it or anything. You can just take it. You don't even have to ask for permission because the understanding is you can just come in and take them and adapt them and use them. And that's the next thing. A lot of them allow you to, to adapt them and to contextualize them for your learning. Um, the, the, uh, they can be adapted. We often use the word repurposing. All right. So the idea then is these are malleable. You can fix them so that they can work for your environment. And what are they? Well, they can be um, anything for teaching and learning. So they can range from a, um, a chart, a photograph, a little piece of music. It can be something as small as that, or it could be something as big as a course with all the components that make up a course, with the exam and with the lectures and with the reading materials and the lab notes and occasionally with student exemplars of work that was done previously. So um, it can range, when we talk of open content, it can range right from one to the other. 
as a little introduction, I'm going to try and play this um, this video. Let me know if you can hear the, the, the words. A few years ago, a professor taught a climate change course reaching about 100 students per semester. One day he thought, If I could upload this course online, then not only would my 100 students have access to it, but others as well. So he did. And this is what happened. Anna sent the course's content across the country to Alex, who was studying climate change. Oops. Sorry. Alex found it so interesting that he forwarded a copy to his friend Lulu in Africa. Lulu was developing peer-to-peer -peer courses with Philip, so they remixed the content with other resources and created a new course about the impacts of climate change in Africa. Alan, a participant in the course, shared the content with Gabby who was studying environmental policy in Latin America. Gabby brought the content to her class, and together they translated it into Spanish. After that, Gabby's professor shared it with his other classes. Myra, another student, shared the content with her father, who passed it on to his colleagues. Gabby's professor also forwarded the content to David, a colleague in the UK who was researching climate change. He updated some of the data, adapted it to his study, and published an article in an open journal. Researchers from all over the world were able to read the article. David sent the updated content back to the original professor. By then, his course had reached so many more people than his 100 students. Years later, many schools had begun to follow the example and open access to their content. Governments began promoting the use of open textbooks, and students began saving money on books. Other innovative universities began to open access to entire courses, making them available to participants from all around the world. These are open educational resources, teaching, learning, research resources that can be reused, redistributed, remixed, and revised. Open educational resources are accessible to everyone. Learners, teachers, researchers, parents, workers, citizens, to you. This is open education. Knowledge as a public good. Everyone has the right to be educated, yet only a few have access to school. Open educational resources increase access to, improve quality of, and reduce costs of education. Sharing, Sharing knowledge, knowledge is, is important. important. you know, open educational resources give everyone the opportunity to learn. Okay, right. So let me just see if the, the, the translation is working. Yeah, it looks like it is. All right. Um, so, these open educational resources then can be anything from small little things like charts and worksheets and um, uh, photograph or uh, but it could also be something a bit bigger it could be simulations or it could be a little bit of programming um, or it could be um, a, a part of a course or a whole course and in the video they actually used a course and the idea was this course went around the world and kept getting translated and recontextualized for various different um, continents and for different learning environments. And uh, so it had a life beyond uh, the uh, just the first 100 students. All right, so that's what we're thinking of here. And as management, you need to consider then, or oh, is this a model that we could actually uh, exploit ourselves? Um, on the one hand, um, are we, um, uh, we, we could find existing courses and then adapt them for uh, use at ISCED, um, or, and or we could release some of our uh, materials with an open license and let other people access them and adapt them for different contexts. So you might say, um, uh, uh, why would you do that? I remember when uh, I was working at the Catholic University of Mozambique, they were furious that a local university, in fact, a big prestigious university down the road, uh, um, had actually um, co-opted 
uh, UCM materials and changed the badge and put their own badge on top of it. And there was like an outroar of how dare these people plagiarize our stuff. Okay, so surely if you were to go for the OER route, this is more likely to happen because you can adapt these materials. And you as management need to think, oh, um, is this useful or is this just making it easier for other people to nick our stuff? All right. And if you look at the little diagram on the right hand side, it says that at the moment there are uh, 1.6 billion open educational resources. So they're not all courses, they range in size, but um, there really now is a lot of stuff out there. All right. So um, uh, why would you do this? Let me just click on. All right. So um, the why would you do this? Why bother? What is the value proposition? So first of all, in terms of if you are consumers of OERs, that means you're going out there, you're finding them, and then you're adapting them to uh, work for ISCED contexts, for the ISCED students. Um, you might want to translate them, for example, then what, what are the benefits? So firstly, it is a cost-effective way to do it. So you don't have to get start from scratch to design a course um, uh, with a content like we were dis discussing last week where you go through the whole learning design process you don't have to do that you can just take an existing course and then adapt it so it is cost effective um, what's nice is that you know that these materials wouldn't have been put out there if they didn't have some merit so if you're not too familiar with the new area that you are now wanting to offer a course in you can go well at least we know that x university ran this course originally obviously we've had to change it to work for the mozambique context but uh, you know that the materials have already been vetted all right so there's a level of quality that you can um that you can Oh, I've got some people coming in that you can um, and use, right? And they're, and they're adaptable. In fact, that's the real power of it is, say, for example, you took a course from MIT, but you knew that some of the technology that they are uh, talking about in those lectures, they, it just doesn't exist in Mozambique. So therefore, you can adapt it and you can swap out certain parts and so on. So that's the beauty there as well, is that you can adapt these things. You might see there I've got OER, but by now you've probably worked out what that is. Um, Open Educational Resources and OCW. What is that? That's open courseware. That's when you've got more than just a couple of worksheets. You've got a whole course available courseware open courseware um all right why would you become producers why would you share your materials okay and um number one reason is it's a very good way to show off so if for promotional reasons if you want isced to be known for offering quality courses then you should release some of your signature courses out there as open courseware so that those people um um People who come across those materials go, oh, shucks, this is from ISCED. This is really good stuff. And even if someone else puts their sticker on it, like we discussed um, earlier, yeah. um, the, there's already a general understanding that, that the original of that particular course came from ISCED. So it's a good way to um, uh, show off, but also um, entrench your copyright. Okay, because you're saying, okay, yes, other people have used it, but we all know that originally it came from ISCED. So the fact that X university up the road has now stuck their sticker on it and has not attributed where it comes from, then uh, we know that they're a bunch of shocks. <laughs> all right. So it's one way of um, promotional, of being, uh, having promotional exposure to quality. And it's also a way of getting a general understanding of where that stuff comes from. If you were to adapt an MIT course, um, it, you can't hide it. it. You might change it into Portuguese and you might add a few Mozambique con uh, case studies. But in the end, it's pretty clear that's the copy of the MIT one. So yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, a Portuguese language? Um, that was a good question. Someone asked me recently, how about um, Portuguese? So um, obviously English is the predominant of those 1.6 billion 
OERs, the vast majority are in English. But I did some a little quick research. I didn't spend very long, long on this. So obviously you guys could spend a bit more time and a bit more effort and dig a bit deeper. But I came across um, global uh, open education, global open education. They have a Latin America section, LATAM, Latin America. Um, of which Brazil is a very important component. And um, those three universities there, uh, one's, I don't know if it's a university, but the bottom one is, um, they're releasing their materials, their Portuguese language materials uh, in a, as open courseware. We'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of this uh, presentation. All right, here's MIT. I'm running out of time, but MIT is the granddaddy. They've been doing this for since 2002. They've been releasing everything that they offer online um, for free. Okay, so um, it's not, they don't run the course, but they give you the course material. So when they say open course where, they mean all the bits and pieces that make up a course. So the lectures, the readings, the schedule, the exam, the memo of the exam, et cetera, are all put out there. And you can see this is the front page. If you go to ocw.mit.edu, this is the front page. You can go through all their different courses. For example, at the moment, health and medicine, public health. And then at the bottom, you can start seeing the list. The first two items of a list appears. Each of those are courses and the whole course is bundled there. You can There's even a zipped file for you to download everything for that particular course. And um, obviously you can use it without asking for permission, but you must acknowledge where the original came from. All right. Um, so yeah, it's worth having a look if you want. If you want to get the, I mean, MIT is one of the top ten universities in the world, so must be good stuff. Um, and you can see it's not just technology; they've got a whole load of humanities and maths and even education. There's a big section on education. All right. So how do we know that the open courseware or the open educational resource is open? All right, and the trick here is you've got to know your Creative Commons licenses. You all know the little C in the circle, full copyright, all rights reserved. But then there's another one, which is CC, Creative Commons, and that means some rights reserved. So the idea then is um, it doesn't lock the whole thing away. It actually leaves it partially open for you to come in and enjoy it. Uh, open licenses reserve specific rights and relax others, making it easier for educators and course designers to use the resources. All right, I'm going to skip this because I think we're running out of time today. All right, I'm going to explain very quickly what these Creative Commons licenses and how they work. The reason why you need to know this is if you are searching for a course and you, you come across the Creative Commons license, there's the six most popular on the screen at the moment. All right, you've got to know what are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do with this resource. Okay, you don't have to ask for permission, but you've got to work within the ethos, uh, the understanding of what they have uh, released it under. All right, so there, if you look on the left, you'll see there are four basic rights that they've reserved. The first one is attribution. I don't know one license which doesn't have the attribution. So it simply means that you can take my resource, you can use it, you can adapt it, you can do whatever you like with it, you can make copies for your faculty, you can make copies for your students, you can create a translator, you can do whatever you like, but somewhere you have to attribute where the source came from. So either the author or the institution who holds the copyright. So A, uh, sorry, the first one, the little man there with by, that is attribution. By means by someone, okay? Nothing special, just means someone made it. All right, by. Um, the next one down there is like the little equal sign. If you look on the left again, no derivative works. If it has this little sticker on the license plate, then it means you may not make changes. You can use the resource however you like, but you can't change it. This is one of the few where they are fixed. You have to use as is. So no derivative works, ND, no derivative works, simply means that... Um, no changes. 
All right. I'm going to jump to the fourth one because the fourth one is easy. All right. This one does have impact for ISCED, and you need to be aware of this one. This is non-commercial. It means you can use the resource. Uh, you can adapt it. You can change it. You can make copies, blah, 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 blah. But you may not make a profit from the intellectual property. So if you are a fee, if you are making a profit, uh, as an, uh, if you are a for-profit organization, and the resource has been released with non-commercial, then you have to be very careful uh, the, in the context in which you actually use it, all right? They could accuse you then that you are using their intellectual property to create profit, all right? Uh, public universities don't seem to worry about this because they use taxpayers' money and run at a, a big loss. They don't run their institution as a business. So uh, public universities, um, tend to be all right. They can use non-commercial. But if you're for profit, then you have to be a little bit careful about how you do it. What normally happens for for profit institutions is that they discount it down because the intellectual property was for free, but then they add the costs of the services on top. So the cost of the tutors, the cost of the data, the cost of all everything else but the intellectual property, uh, which is considered free. All right, so that's how they get around the non-commercial problem. And then share alike, if you see SA, share alike, it simply means that the derivatives that you create from the original, the, 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 the versions that you create from the original must be copyrighted in the same way. They must have the same license. They must be shared in the same way. They need to be shared alike, all right? So if it means it has CC BY, SA, for example, then it means that the new version that you've created, the Portuguese version that you've created, needs to have CC by SA as the license as well. All right, so it's a kind of a way to lock in the openness of it so that it doesn't get um, trapped inside a copyrighted, fully copyrighted um, resource. And then those four rights can be reorganized into combinations. And that's what those six licenses are on the right hand side. So CC by, CC by SA, CC by NC, CC by ND, CC by NCSA, CC by NCND. Okay, so um, what do they mean? Number one, you can do whatever you like, CC by. You can do whatever you like with my resource. You can make as many copies as you like. You can change it. You can translate it. You can do whatever. But you must somewhere say that the original came from me, from an author or an institution. CC by SA, you can do whatever you like with this resource. You can make copies, you can share it, um, you can adapt it, but you must attribute where it comes from and your new version needs to have exactly this license, CC by SA. Number three, CC by NC uh, means that you can do whatever you like with this resource, but you must attribute where it comes from and you may not use it for profit Okay, it has to be um, uh, um, for nonprofit. Uh, CC by ND simply means that you can do whatever you like with this, but you must attribute where it comes from and you may not change it. You have to use it exactly the same as it is. CC by NCSA, you can do whatever you like, but you must attribute, you must not make a profit from it, and your version must carry that license, CC by NCSA. And finally, this one is not that different from full copyright. It's quite restrictive, except you can make as many copies as you like. But if you have CC by NC and D, then you must attribute where it comes from. You may not make a profit from it. And you need to keep it as is. You can't change it. So it's quite restrictive, that last one. We often talk of um, different levels of openness. So number one, is very open. There's a lot of stuff you can do without uh, having to worry. Whereas number six is pretty restrictive. Uh, there's not a lot you can do except make copies of it. All right. So keep that in mind. Then there are different levels of openness. There's CC by, by SA, by ND, uh, sorry, by NC, by ND, by NCSA, and by NCND. All right. 
Do you think you got that? Any questions? I would like to know about the public domain. Uh, if we, uh, how do we see? We see only CC uh, in case of public domain. Um, all right. So uh -huh. there's, you're 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 right. There's actually um, one that is missing, um, and that is uh, what they call CC zero. CC zero is the same as public domain. So where does that fit in? So if you think of that continuum again, where you had CC, um, uh, C in a little circle, full copyright, then you've got these six in the middle, and then right at the other extreme, you have um, public domain, PD, public domain, or sometimes CC, zero. Why zero? Zero rights reserved. Now, the interesting thing about CC zero or public domain is that you don't even have to attribute where you got the resource from. Okay, there's no attribution. It just says you can just use it as you want. The author has basically surrendered the resource. So the resource now is out there in the public domain. He has no, he or she has no right um, to uh, ask for any money for it or any recognition or so on. So a lot of people don't like public domain, because they say, hey, it, there was still a lot of work putting that together. I would at least like to be acknowledged for what I've done. So that's why a lot of educators prefer the Creative Commons, those six licenses on the screen at the moment. Any other questions? Andrew? Yes? Um, I would like to understand clearly the concept of uh, non-commercial. Non yes. Um, you see, we are an institution, and if you use uh, uh, some uh, some license, non-commercial license, yes. what's the meaning of that? Because we have students, and they are fee-paying students. All right. So, um, the if you, um, for example, MIT's uh, materials are um, the. The, uh, they are the, I'm trying to remember, CC by NCSA. I think they're the number five. All right. So the idea then is theirs is non commercial. So are you allowed to use an MIT course and then use it for the, um, uh, as part of a normal course at ISED? I would argue you can't. All right. Because you are for profit, therefore, you, um, that course would have to be costed differently. If you were to use that one, then I would say you need to um, uh, offer it with a dif different costing setup. So you would have to say that the uh, this, this course, uh, the intellectual property is free, but uh, we will charge you for the exam, we will charge you for the tuition, we will charge you for uh, the data that you need in order to access the course, blah, 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 blah. So you would have to uh, structure the way that you uh, make your profit from that course um, by the other services that you're offering. You can't do it by selling the course as such, because the course was offered to you for free. And as long as it was kept that way. Or you can just say, okay, we will find other resources, open educational resources that don't have NC in it. We will make sure we exclude any materials which have NC as part of the license. So that's another way you can get around that problem. Any other questions? Did I answer the question? Thank you, Dr. Spear. All right, um, let's, any other questions? Unmute my. Yeah, okay, I have a question, Andrew. Yes. Um, in some situations, um, an employee's contract Binds that employee that anything that that employee produces. Oh, sorry, hang on. All right, anything, sorry. An employee's contract, yes. Yeah. Anything that that employee produces um, is a property for the employer. 
So when it comes to this academic uh, intellectual property issue, where do we draw the line? Does it belong to the person or it belongs to the institution? All right. Um, uh, Creative Commons doesn't care. All right. So you can say that um, the... uh, even though it has a Creative Commons license and that you're offering it to the world uh, without having to ask for permission or pay subscriptions, the copyright belongs to ISCED. So your, your, your existing contract means that no matter who puts your course together, the copyright holder is the institution. It's not the author. All right. And that's fine. So it just means that when the license goes out, it'll say that attribution I-S-C-E-D. All right. That's the way your contract is organized. Um, If you have used other people's works as part of this new course, um, I-S-C-E-D still holds the copyright for that particular version. All right. So um, uh, it's not like now because you have an MI component of an MIT uh, course in there that. MIT holds it. No, it's moved to you because you have ISED, because you ISED has done the adaptations, it's done the translation, it's done all the other things. But there will be somewhere in the license where you've said, and uh, these are the these are the resources we adapted. All right. And one of them is from MIT. So that's how it works. So your contract's still fine. It just means that the team who puts it together um, will um, be acknowledged as developers, but they won't be the copyright holder. Okay. So um, if someone from an institution violates the copyright law, can I sue the institution? So say it again. So if... If, say, an employee from an institution violates the copyright law, can I sue the institution or I can only sue that individual? No, not really, because it's an OER. I would assume that you have to now release this resource with an open license, all right? So this new course that you've developed using other people's resources, um, even though uh, ISED is the copyright holder, um, you would still need to release it also with an open license. I mean, you didn't write half the stuff. You wrote, um, you just you just supplemented what had already been done. So the employee leaves the institution and then he takes a copy of the ISCED course and then he contextualizes it for his new institution. I'm afraid that's allowed. That's fine. That's what open educational resources are about. It's about making... Um, copies of copies and making adaptations and improving the course based on who you're trying to teach. So I think you would lose if you were to take it to court because in the end, it wasn't yours to begin with. You adapted someone else's. So it does need a different mindset. The the mindset isn't about um, clinging to copyright. The mindset now is to make sure that you are are attributed for your contributions to developing that course or that resource. So it is a different mindset now. It's not about um, trying to ring fence the intellectual property and say that it's mine. You're now trying to say it is mine. We don't mind other people using it, but you must attribute us as playing uh, a significant contribution to the piece that you are using. Okay, so it is a different approach to copyright holding. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to see if any of this rubbed off on you. So give me a second. I want you to use a second browser window. Let me just show you the, the – uh, we're going to give you a test. Uh, we're going Andrew? To use, yes. Yep. You did not fully answer the, 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 the professor's question. He, he asked about, in case of violation, an individual who is working for an institution violates the copyright law, who is uh, culpable for that violation? Okay, I did, because I made the assumption that normally... On, if you had built a course from scratch 
and it is fully copyrighted as ISCED. And then he buggers off and he takes it with him. Then you can sue him. All right. Because you have all rights reserved. It's the little C in the circle. Full copyright. They may do nothing without asking for permission. All right. But if we have created a Creative Commons course, which means you took another course from some other institution, like one of those Portuguese language Brazilian universities, and now it wouldn't have the full C on it. It would have a CC on it. It would be Creative Commons attribution or something like that. All right. Well, then it's a bit pointless to sue the person. You would lose because it's not about um, you are the sole principal holder of the copyright. All the people who worked on that particular course at different institutions in the past and now going into the future are all part of the team who is constantly evolving that resource. So yes, their contributions need to be attributed, but it's not like you guys have the sole copyright for that particular new Creative Commons course. So therefore you would lose because the license doesn't say that you do have the sole copyright. All right, so it's a different mindset. The idea here is that you just want to be acknowledged for your contribution in taking that course to the next stage. Maybe it was translation into Portuguese. Maybe it was putting in Mozambique case studies. Maybe it was developing a new component of it, perhaps a different assessment strategy or something. So the idea then is you're just adding to something that's already existed in the past and that will exist in the future. If, this, if the teacher buggers off and takes a copy of it and then adapts it again, well, then that's allowed. The copyright allows that. Okay, so then you wouldn't sue them because it wasn't yours in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm answered. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Now we're gonna. I'm gonna test you. So, um, what you need to do is you need to open another browser. Uh, uh, <laughs> since you saw the previous slide. All right. So again, can you either open another browser window and navigate to www.cahoots.it? It's up there in the top of the screen. When you arrive on that screen, uh, you'll see there's a place for a game pin. Can you put the game pin in? It is one in four. Six, five, one, eight. I've got two people in, Martin and Eddie, so far. Where's the rest? Can you do? 
Okay, right. So that was a bit of fun. Um, uh, of the people who were involved, um, I'd like to think that they came on strong towards the end. There were a couple of little dodgy bits in the middle, but um, those 10 people seem to know their Creative Commons licenses. So thank you. Well done. I'm hoping those people who were not in the test but were watching were also scoring well. Okay. And so... Um, um, part of your uh, week's work is to go in a little bit deeper. So uh, when you go into the Moodle and do your week's work, there's a little tutorial on finding open content. How can you find um, uh, these resources. It explains how you can find them in YouTube and how you can use Google and adjust Google, etc., uh, to find what you're looking for. So that's going to be as part of your week's work. And there's another one for those of you who have a little bit of extra time and whose uh, mandate actually is in course construction and so on. Uh, there's a section on how do you adapt them. So when you find them and you decide you want to use them, how do you actually pull them apart and reassemble them in a new way. So some advice there on adapting open content that's also in your Moodle's week work. All right, which brings me to Portuguese language resources. And um, I want to say that um, this is probably for ISCED, the biggest hurdle you've got to now, uh, if you want to go this route and you want to start having some of your courses um, adapted from existing OERs or open courseware. Um, obviously, it would be easier if they were Portuguese language. Um, so, the uh, how would you uh, go about that? All right. Now, before we start, just keep in mind that um, it the license allows you to do the translation. So, you could always take an English course and then employ someone to do the translation into uh, Portuguese language. All right. So, keep that in in mind, but it does make sense that you would like to be able to review and you're more in control when you uh, are working in a language that is familiar. So yes, these are three uh, Brazilian institutions I'm aware of that are re releasing their materials as uh, open courseware. I, 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 I can't tell you a lot about that, but uh, let's just go in here. I'm just going to call up this link. Um, and I'm going to share my screen so you can see it. All right. Um, so when I went looking around for Portuguese language um, materials, the obvious place to start was at Global Open Education. So Global Open Education is a consortium of institutions around the world who have agreed to share their materials. They use open licenses. And um, the idea is that they put them in a repository and then the, uh, people can, uh, uh, anyone can come and take them and adapt them and so on. I'm just going to translate. I think it's in Spanish. Uh, um, the <laughs> I don't even have Spanish, never mind Portuguese. Um, so I'm just going to translate this page uh, uh, using my browser into English. So you'll see up here, I've got a little button that says translate from, um, from Spanish to English. And I'm going to say yes, please, so I can see what's going on. And give it a moment. 
All right. So now uh, I can see what's going on. Um, the the I've just chosen Brazil because I know they speak Spanish, um, and it says um, that quite a number of them uh, are beginning to a number of institutions are beginning to now uh, release their works as open courseware. Um, it says here. Brazil has had a substantial level of activity in the promotion of REAs or OERs as open education, particularly at the federal level, which means a lot of government institutions are now beginning to think about um, uh, releasing their materials with an open license. Uh, they mentioned some components, but it looks like that the person, uh, the institution that is driving this is the Open University of Brazil or UAB. Um, there's another man from Brasilia who's also doing stuff, Universidade Alberta do Brasil, uh, and so on. All right. Um, Sixty-hour courses for teachers, researchers, and things. Blah 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 blah. Ministry of Education, through ordinance so and so, has provided that all resources for basic education purchased or financed by the ministry must be openly licensed and available on public servants to public servants. They are organizing training workshops. Okay, uh, who are we? translating meet the team sorry let's just see who we've got here from brazil uh, mexico costa rica mexico chile brazil this character here university of brasilia he is a professor involved uh, as part of this process all right so um i can't give you specific courses that you could adapt. I would think that you would need to um, start thinking about developing a relationship with uh, someone like this. All right. Um, it would need some um, investigation. I, uh, f but I think before you would do that, you would need to make some decisions as management. Um, so here are my implications for management. Um, First of all, is this something that you're interested in doing? All right. It does require management to weigh in. Whenever I've worked at an institution where they're doing a little pilot, the, the staff who are involved with the pilot feel very insecure because management hasn't weighed in with a policy. They keep saying to me, but there's no policy. There's no policy. All right. And therefore, I think management needs to make a commitment. Um, I wouldn't say you need to go either one way or the other. I think ideally you've got to decide, are you going to incorporate um, uh, open education as a component of the uh, ethos of the ISCED, all right? Are you going to allow some components of your course to be licensed openly? Um, are you clear on what your role for intellectual property is? A lot of institutions now are taking their IP policy and they are beginning to incorporate clauses which allow an opt out. Uh, normally, the IP policy is uh, quite uh, strict about um, controlling uh, the, copy, uh, the potential copyright of materials developed within an institution, uh, and mainly because they believe it's a potential income. Um, avenue. Um, however, I would say that you should really experiment with both. So if there is potential to make some income from something, then yes, keep it fully co copyrighted. But if you feel there is a, uh, opportunities here to have a relationship with other institutions who are developing similar types of materials and courses to you, then it would be stupid to then say, oh, but we can't because our IP policy says everything is controlled by the institution and therefore we can't have open educational resources. So I think management needs to sit down and have this discussion about are we going to experiment and allow some of our intellectual property to be released with open licenses? Um, okay. 
if you are going to start using open content, then you've really got to also be a contributor. You've got to take and also release stuff as well. You can't really, um, you're not playing the game if you are only consuming OERs, but you don't produce OERs. So again, that would need management to say, okay, in this instance, this makes sense. This is something for the public good. This is something we don't mind being out there with our branding on it, but at no cost, etc. So keep that in mind. Then uh, based on my last slide there, I would say that for it to really work nicely, I think uh, you guys would have to start thinking about talking to other Lucifone institutions who are working in a similar open environment uh, and then start saying, okay, we all produce this course, you produce that one, and then we'll share them. That type of relationship, I think, would be quite useful. Should you become a member of OE Global? Okay, this is that screen I showed you earlier. It might be an idea. This might be how to create that relationship um, between other Lucifone institutions is through OE Global. So maybe experiment there and have a look. What are the implications of being part of this consortium? And then ideally, you're going to have to show up front that you are serious about this. So maybe one or two of your signature courses could be released with a Creative Commons license to demonstrate that, yeah, you are contributors as well as consumers of open content. Okay. And I think that's what I wanted you to look at today. All right, let's open it up. Uh, we've got a few minutes for um, discussion. Any issues that I've raised that you would like to um, hear about? Where's my participants list? Here we go. What do you think? Is this a bridge too far? Is this something worth investigating further? I've given you a little introduction. Uh, I, I would like to know, uh, I would like to know about the possibility of um, sharing, for example, uh, virtual libraries with others. Um, this is something we've been discussing. I think uh, the, uh, Dr. Shimuzu could explain even much better. Uh, uh, but but the, the, the point is, we would like to develop our virtual library. And um, we're searching for resources or alternatives. And uh, it's true that uh, uh, if we use uh, Portuguese uh, written resources or so, so uh, that would be much better. And uh, I would like to know if there are really good alternatives or ways to, for example, find such kind of resources, libraries, for example. All right. So my experience of libraries is that they are very much in the other camp, the full copyright uh, environment. Most textbooks, in fact, the vast majority of books generally are published <coughs> books um, and the publishers it's their income, it's their income stream, and they are particularly pedantic about lending um, uh, uh, books out. So the universities who have virtual libraries tend to have a very strict um, copyright management system where um, even though um, they are digital and therefore there's no physical cost of a book, um, the, that you still have to check books out even online and then you have to put them back before someone else can take it out because there are only so many authorized copies, etc. So these virtual libraries tend to be very much about gatekeeping, about controlling access to various resources which the institution has bought. And that's all because of full copyright. All right. So um, if would you go in partnership with another institution? Yeah, why not? Um, but it will have costs involved because the publishers are uh, wanting their cut in terms of um, how many resources they have sold to the library, whoever's library that is. 
Could you have a repository where you have lots of open educational resources? Yes, you could do that. It's a bit different. Um, there you wouldn't be worried about who's got the book and who takes it out. You would just allow people to take copies of whatever is in the database. Um, it would still need someone to look after it and to um, a librarian to find new resources and to upload and to put the metadata in so that they can be found when people are searching for them. Um, that's a very different setup whereby you're not so much about the gatekeeping, you're more about a basket of goodies which you are allowing people to come in and take a copy for themselves. Um, so there's less security, it's more about making it accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so, so your question then is, what type of library do you have in mind? Is it one of these open databases or is it really the closed gatekeeping style of like a traditional library, but online. I would like to, to maybe call Dr. Shimuzu to explain much better because he's been the one talking much about that. Dr. Shimuzu? Hello. Um, yeah, I... I... <laughs> I've been talking about this because I am an advocate for open educational resources. And the challenge that we have currently is that initially we had uh, a virtual library which, uh, with, with some content, um, which was good, but however, uh, books are expensive. And if you want to have books in our uh, locked kind of uh, library just for our students for internal consumption, then that means you have to pay for uh, yeah. licenses and things like that. And uh, the point here is that uh, we probably, most probably if the administration agrees, is that we move towards uh, open educational resources. And a repository, from my point of view, will be uh, the best alternative now. Because for now, uh, I'm not saying that uh, our students are limited, but uh, for now, we need to understand first our students, our main uh, uh, customers. These are uh, uh, customers in terms of educational content. And they are not yet trained in searching for material. That is some kind of training that maybe in the future we can, we, we can provide. But for now, they are not able to do proper uh, research in terms of uh, material. So somehow there is need for us to identify materials and compile these materials and maybe uh, either place links or, or the actual uh, uh, electronic documents in a repository and guide the students to use those materials for the various courses. Uh, I think that's where the, the, the of the professor Kambaza wanted to. Okay. To um, uh, Andrew, uh, let me, yeah. Can I contribute here? I mean, the term virtual library is very, very broad. Because as Andrew explained, there are categories of virtual libraries. And there are some of them which can be very, very expensive if you want to subscribe. These um, databases uh, for journals and textbooks and the rest. So um, if he said wants to um, get a sort of virtual library as his put, I'll call it a repository as uh, Dr. Chimuzu just stated, so that we can have a repository where we can either create links or provide local materials for students to access. But if you are going to look at it from its broader perspective and do the subscription from some places, it might cost, he said, a lot of money. The best is just to make use of the OER and then create a sort of our own um, local repository to provide the resources for the students. I, I, in the end, I think you need both. Um, I, I think that 
um, try and build a repository of OERs, which are free for use. But um, maybe in time, you also need to go for like the, the traditional uh, online virtual library, which is the, the publishing gatekeeping one. Um, I, I, again, that's, that's kind of your call. You're going to have to decide what is your model. Are you trying to provide access to academic materials um, to, to your fee-paying students? Or are you going to try and save costs by offering them um, open equivalents? I, I don't know. That's something you're going to have to make the call on. Uh, in terms of setting up your own OER repository, that's technically, that's pretty easy. Um, uh, in terms of um, getting together a, a, a traditional virtual university uh, library, then that's expensive. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know the answer. You're going to have to think about that one. Um, what's your model? What's your ethos as an institution? Are you trying to open up education or are you part of the deal which is trying to keep it a closed environment? Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Andrew. Yes. Yeah. We, we, we have a repository which we created in D space. Yes. I using the, 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 the D space of software. But then the biggest challenge has been that uh, we have assigned coordinators to upload, to identify material and upload it to the repository. Right. But then there is a lack of capacity to, to, to identify material mm -hmm. and upload it to the uh, repository. And fill the metadata. But the biggest challenge has been that there is no capacity, there is lack of capacity to identify open educational resources per se. We have had instances where we've uploaded copyrighted materials onto that database. And we've been uh, in some sort of trouble with some uh, yeah. Yeah. entities. We have, we have raised that you guys are, are violating uh, copyrights because you have uploaded our book onto your repository. So, so, so this is the main challenge which I think we have. In terms of decision, yes, we want a repository, but the repository has to comply with the copyright uh, regulations. Yeah. So there is need to capacitate the people who upload the material. Okay. Um, the the homework for this coming week, there is a uh, a tutorial which covers what I try to do quickly in the presentation on what are the licenses, and then there's a section on how do you find the materials so that you can interpret the license. So it looks like. We need to get your little team of repository builders to actually do that little tutorial uh, in a, and obviously master it so that they know how to go out and find the resources and then understand what the copyright conditions are. And then they need to capture that as part of the metadata in the DSpace. Um, I'm not a fan of the DSpace software. I think it's very clunky, but it is, but it is strong. It, it is a good little database so um you know that's another story for another time but i would say if you need to capacitate your your curators your um then we've got materials that we can help them get up to speed with what are the licenses and how do you find these resources as you will find out <laughs> you're about to do it this week it's one of one of the little tutorials we've got for you All right, we've we hit. I try to keep it tight, but we have such good conversations that it's gone to ninety minutes again. Um, let me very quickly show you this week's work on the on the thing. Uh, here we go. Share. I want that one. Um, all right. So, um, as I said to those people who were on time, we were discussing last week's work. Um, I'm very excited by the quality of the discussions in the forum. 
Um, so please make sure that you do get involved. I see that there's like a core of about 12 to 15 people who are really uh, engaged. I want to see the rest of you in there. Um, all right, so this is this week's one. I'm going to uh, stop the recording in a moment and I'll stick it here for you guys. So you can always go back and have a look what I said on various issues if you feel it's important. But here are our two little tutorials. If you only do one, you please do this one here. Find open content. It also covers the Creative Commons licensing and what the licenses mean again, because I went very fast. All right. Um, and that's the one I'm thinking maybe we need to get our curators, the repository curators, to actually do this as well so that they know what they're looking for. Um, and then there's a little discussion about what do you think the role of open content is for ISCED? ISCED. So if you could also go in there and uh, post your thoughts. I've heard from a few people uh, at the end of this presentation, but I'd like to hear from all of you, please. So can you go in and go into the forum and have your say? All right. And so it's not over, it's not overbearing this week, um, but I would say if you, if you only do one thing, please have a look at this. This will kind of, it's, it is fun. It's got video and multimedia and stuff. So it's, it's engaging. Yeah, you'll find it enjoyable. Okay. Any other questions for now? Okay. Well, um, I think that the, the, the today's topic, it was a, a great one. Uh, Maybe we will have question when we try to use it in day life. It's not easy to to say today everything about the the, the this regulation. But uh, I think that one of the problem we have is when we want to share the, the knowledge uh, in in many materials. In Portuguese, they are full, uh, full right um, copies. So that's why sometimes it's not easy for us. Um, and you, you kind of where we were in terms of English resources about f say seven or seven years ago, where we were really struggling to get like momentum but now with english oers it's just exploded so um, but it needs people to come on board to to participate so for example if iscd starts to release just a couple of portuguese uh, language uh, teaching resources then already you're beginning to build towards getting that momentum in terms of portuguese language content so um, I get it. I was there a few years ago. We were really struggling to find appropriate stuff, whereas now it's getting much, much easier in English. So I hear you. I hear you. So, but I, I think that uh, for for us, maybe the strategy will be to translate those materials that the license can allow us to make a translation. So that that's one of the way to to get the material, it's the translation. That's like an obvious first step, is just find quality OERs which talk to what you're doing, but in English, and then invest in the translation. And then that can be the contribution. And then uh, and then already, uh, wow, what a, that's cool. You've opened up a whole new resource for a whole load of new uh, learners across Lucifone uh, countries. So. Yeah, that seems like an obvious first way to tackle the, the issue. I have a question. Sure. If the license, if the license is not uh, share like uh, SA, I mean, um, is it possible to share the material in a less restrictive uh, um, way? Sure. Yes. Um, uh, 
even when I'm right, when I'm doing a course, I often um, decide to get around that problem, but just by being very pedantic about which OERs I've used. And then, um, so I list everything I touch and occasionally there are essays in there. And, um, but my course is actually offered as say CC by, for example. And the, uh, that's how I like to think I can get around it. Technically it's not really allowed, but if you have already said, here's the original, this is what I've done to it. And my version is in this lesser one. Uh, let me just give you an example. Let's see if I can call it up. Give me a second and I'll just show you. Uh, it makes more if you can see it rather than me just talk about it. Uh, here it comes. Uh, I'm going to show you the tutorial I want you to do. Um, the one you're going to do today is this one. So, um, uh, Here's the tutorial, how to search, how to use YouTube filters, blah, 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 blah. And then right at the bottom, here's my attribution. So, um, um, and uh, I've said, these are the OERs which I adapted to create this tutorial that you're going to do, blah, 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 blah. And you can see I've linked back to where they are and I've put in the license. And the vast majority of them are CC by, CC by, CC by, CC by. But there occasionally there's these guys here. And I just thought, <laughs> bugger it. <laughs> it's such a nice resource. I want to use this resource, even though it says SA. And yet my license is CC. Here's my license. CC by. Then um, tough. I've said where they come from. If they've got an issue, they can come to me and say, sorry, you can't do that, and I'll take it out. But for now, I've stuck it in, even though it's CC BY. Technically, that's not really allowed, all right? Um, here's one that's uh, BY NC, non-commercial, but my course isn't for commercial purposes. We're basically giving it away, so we're not too worried. We can use those with pleasure. Uh, another NC. Yeah, otherwise it's, I'm pretty by the rules. But then I did use a resource. I didn't adapt it and I haven't incorporated it in my resource, but I have linked to it. So then I put it under another section called references. So um, obviously I was influenced by it, but I haven't copied and pasted it into my course and I haven't um, uh, adapted it in any way. I've just linked to it. So therefore you can link to um, fully copyrighted materials, but then you'd put them in a separate section. They're under references, like we would normally cite anyway as academics when we're creating a paper or whatever. So yeah, there you go. So you can, <laughs> if you bend the rules a little bit. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, that's not the end of the game. The game is that you're going to now fiddle this this week in this, this little tutorial. And uh, there's a forum. You can uh, raise your issues in the forum. This time I'll be better. I'll, I'll get in earlier than I did. I got in very late uh, uh, this time. But we do have a full week. So we're going to meet again on Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday, at the same time. This is going to be our regular slot for number four of eight sessions. I'm hoping you're finding these useful and that they are raising issues, um, which as management you need to engage with in order of finding a way forward for ISCD. Okay. <laughs>